the next section we're going to be dealing with talks about the idea of definitions, which is why they have this close up on the definition of definition in the dictionary. And what we're going to talk about in particular is what makes a good definition, because that ends up being kind of important in geometry and everywhere else for that matter. Tells you the good definitions are important because you need to make sure that everybody understands what it is you're talking about. If I give you a word like segment or ray or something like that, you need to know what I'm talking about when I say segment or ray. You need to know, for instance, that a ray goes on in one direction, but a segment stops. And so I need to make sure that I do have the same idea in my mind that everybody else should when we have definitions. I put that graphic at the bottom that says on the same page. You want to make sure everybody's on the same page about whatever you're talking about. There are in geometry basically three things that make a good definition. All of which can be kind of important. The first thing, it says you want to make sure that you use clear, easily understandable terms. I would bet that at some point in your life, everybody in here has either gone to a traditional dictionary like you see at the bottom there and tried to look up a word, or maybe you've Googled the term. And when you get done, you really don't know any more about what it means than when you started. Sometimes you're even more confused. That's because the definition is like harder to understand than the original term. So you want to make sure that you use things that people can actually understand. You don't want to use big complicated terms that nobody knows. Second one says be precise. You want to make sure that you can tell whatever it is you're trying to define apart from anything you might confuse it with. Now, maybe I want to do a definition of Ashlyn Hovey back there. And I want to make sure I can tell her apart from Aiden Hovey or from Denise Hovey or from every other person in her class or anybody else that we might possibly confuse her with, we want to make sure that we can tell it apart from all the possibilities that we might confuse things with. Okay? The last thing says be reversible. And that's actually where it really becomes geometric and kind of fits into stuff that we talked about before. Basically, it's like if I give you a word, you should be able to give me the definition. And if I give you the definition, you should know what word it is. It's kind of like, you know, both sides of the flashcard. You have to make sure that it makes sense both directions when you do things. That's what reversible means. So going along with that is a new term that we want you to be familiar with, which is what's called a biconditional. What a biconditional basically means is that you have an if-then sentence that would also make sense if I did the converse, if I turned it around and went backwards. I had an example earlier when we were going through the assignment where I said, if today is Thursday, then tomorrow is Friday. It would also make sense if I said, if today is, or if tomorrow is Friday, then today is Thursday. That makes sense in both directions. That's why I could put it together and make a biconditional. In your book and in math books in general, they often will use the phrase if and only if when they're saying a biconditional. They might say something like, today is Thursday, if and only if, tomorrow is Friday. And again, it just means if the first thing, then the second. And if the second thing, then the first. You can go both ways and it will still make sense. Now I have a whole bunch of symbols that people sometimes use for that. Sometimes you will see like a double arrow. In your book, you're more likely to see the abbreviation IFF, which just means if and only if. 
And again, it just means you can say if the first thing, then the second, or if the second thing, then the first. Something you will be asked to do when we get to the assignment is to look at something that has if and only if in it. And the directions will say, write this with two if-then sentences. So like here it says, a ray is an angle bisector if and only if it divides an angle into two congruent angles. And anybody tell me an if-then sentence or eventually two if-then sentences that would come from that? So go ahead. And so what he basically just said there is if the first part, then the second. Yeah, if I was a little bit more careful on saying it, I'd say if a ray is an angle bisector, then it divides the angle into two congruent angles. That would be the idea of it. Anyone know the other if-then sentence that we could do? Which is equally easy, Adi. So I'm going to tell you, you actually made this a little bit harder than it really is, because you don't actually need to look specifically at the picture. Although what you said isn't really wrong. What you, the more general way of doing it, though, is just look at that original sentence up at the top and basically go through it backwards. What I would say is an angle divides it into two. I'm going to say if it, an angle is divided into two congruent angles, then that ray is an angle bisector. Okay, you basically said that using the angle that's in the picture, and again, as long as you had if the first part, then the second, yeah, that would end up being okay. So yeah, if it divides it into two congruent angles, then it's an angle bisector. That's the other way. The quick way to do that is say if the first part, then the second, and then turn it around and say if the second part, then the first. Any question on doing that part? So there are the two ways that I would probably do it for this one. Okay with those two. When you write a biconditional, basically what it's saying is that both the statement and its converse are true. So all you really have to do for the second of those if-then sentences is write the converse exactly like you did yesterday for the assignment that you were doing. We're going to look at a couple of other examples today, and that's pretty much the last part we're going to do. Here is something that might or might not be a definition. It says a candy is an M&M &M if and only if it melts in your mouth but not in your hands which I believe is an advertising slogan for m &Ms. So I've got a couple of questions, and we'll come back to this in a second. I want to know, is that true? Is that a good definition of M&Ms, and why? Okay, so we'll go back to this. Candy is an M&M if and only if it melts in your mouth but not in your hands. So I'm going to start with the first question there. Is that true? What do you think? Is that a true statement? So I'm seeing two or three people that are kind of nodding no on that. And you probably are correct. Okay. I asked him why in sixth period. Anyone want to try and tell me why that would not be true? Okay. Which would be a reason why, yeah, that's also why it's not a good definition. I'll tell you that. When I asked this in sixth period, I had someone that said, because I had a bunch of M&Ms at baseball last summer and they all melted. <laughs> and especially in places that are hot and humid like Iowa, you do find that things like M&Ms and Skittles will actually melt even in your hands and you can get like disgusting colors all over your hands if you try that. It is also not a good definition because exactly like Matt said, it doesn't tell it apart from Skittles or other candies that you might have. So no, that one is not a good definition. Here's another question. It says, what would be a good definition of Bishop Garrigan High School? 
So I want you to think about that for just a second. Hmm. So Cal wants to give me an answer there. So he said that Bishop Garrigan High School is a Catholic school and I'll go to Iowa. Now I'm going to tell you, no matter what you would have said, I probably would find a way to tear it apart. So don't, don't worry about that when I do this with yours. His is actually very close to being true. In fact, it's a lot better than what most people said. But I think there's also another Catholic school in Algona, Iowa, that's right next door to St. Cecilia's. <laughs> he could have added, however, one more word in there. He could have said it's a Catholic high school in Algona, Iowa, and that would have been perfect. And that would have been fine for doing it. Now, I also, I think I heard Audie saying it's something like a high school in class 1A in Algona or something along that line. And that actually would be enough that it would limit it to us rather than some other things. I've had people before where they'll say like it's a high school in Algona. And obviously that could also be Algona High. <laughs> I've had people that have said it's a Catholic high school. And there's like literally thousands of Catholic high schools in America. You know, you do need to be a, give enough information that you can tell it apart from everything else. So, yeah. And we're pretty much done. So, yeah, cheerleaders can go. That'll be good. <laughs> All right. So, again, you want to remember that a biconditional is something where you can say if and only if, and you can go in both directions. And a good definition, you got to tell it apart from anything you can use it with.